Well, a professor at uh, Westmont College in California set out to determine the likelihood that one person could fulfill all of the prophecies that we find in the Old Testament about the coming of the Messiah. Uh, there are debatable numbers about how many there are. Uh, there's uh, one individual, Alfred Edersheim, who's a respected uh, theologian and uh, historian uh, who believes that there were up to 450 plus prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming of the Messiah. But this man decided, well, we're, we're going to start with one. So he took a, a group of, of six classes that he had there at Westmont, numbering about, or 12 classes rather, excuse me, numbering over 600 students, that, that is. And he began to work through uh, this question. What's the likelihood? So they took one to start with, the, the prophecy in Micah 5, 2, that one would be born from Bethlehem, this little town of no great renown that we just sang about. Micah 5, 2, but you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, too little to be counted among the rulers, among the tribes. From you will come forth a ruler. From you will come forth this Messiah. What's the likelihood that one person would be born in Bethlehem? Well, judging from the population numbers from that time, as well as as it moved forward, and the Earth's population across the whole thing, these students came up with a conservative estimate that it was one in 300,000 chances that somebody could be born in Bethlehem around the time that Christ was born. One in 300,000. Those are not great odds to begin with, right? That's just one prophecy. So he broadened it. He said, okay, let's, let's go from one to eight. Eight prophecies. What is going to happen if we broaden it to eight? What are the chances going to be that somebody fulfilled all eight of these? Well, the students set out, and the, the parameters were they had to agree together. They had to come up with a number that was conservative enough that everybody could get behind it and say, yeah, we're, we're good with that. That sounds good to us. We can agree with that number. So that's what they set out to do. Well, when they looked at one, or one person fulfilling all eight of these that they chose, the likelihood was one over 10 to the, and here comes back math. So this is PTSD for some of you in the room. 10 to the 17th power. Okay, that means 10 with 17 zeros after it. That number, we have no frame of reference for that number. So you're sitting out there going, great, what does that mean? Okay, here's, let's think about it this way. Think about it as a silver dollar, okay? That's what that is there in that gentleman's hand. Think if you took silver dollars and you covered the state of Texas. If you took one to, or if you took 10 to the 17th power number of silver dollars, you could cover the entire state of Texas two feet deep in silver dollars. That's the size of the number that we're dealing with in 10 to the 17th power. And then imagine if I took one of those silver dollars, didn't tell you where it was, marked it, and set you loose to have one shot to pick out one silver dollar with the right mark on it. That's the likelihood that Jesus just fulfilled eight of the Messianic prophecies about him. Broaden that to 450 plus. And here's the thing, y'all. He did. That's what the New Testament teaches us. That way, that's what history bears out as well. Jesus came and fulfilled all of these. And part of the point of this whole series about what child is this is the goal is to, to bolster your faith and to increase your confidence in who God is and the promises that he's made and the promise that he has made that he will come and one day fully deliver us. But that deliverance began with the baby in a manger. And that birth of the baby in the manger fulfilled so many of those prophecies. We looked at one already, and that was the prophecy of Jesus as the son of Adam. That Jesus came to succeed where the first Adam failed, and that because of that, now you and I can have righteousness that we couldn't produce on our own. Well, this morning we're going to look at Jesus as the son, not of Adam, but now Jesus, the son of Abraham. Jesus, the son of Abraham. In Matthew's gospel, Matthew's gospel opens with another one of those genealogies. We talked about Luke's last week, which ends with Jesus as the son of, or son of Adam. But Matthew's gospel opens with Jesus as the son of Abraham, which begs the question, okay, why did Matthew stop with Abraham? Well, for the Jewish people, and that was a lot of Matthew's original audience, Abraham had massive significance. You guys remember the song growing up, right? Father Abraham had many what? Many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left. We're not going to stand up and do that. But you remember the song. That was about the, the promise made to Abraham. And we're going to talk about that promise this morning. That Abraham, Abraham was going to be made into a nation through his descendants. Many offspring. So there's great significance there. But Matthew was after something more. Christmas is so much about family, isn't it? You think about Christmas season coming up, that you're going to spend it with family, that you're going to have memories that you're going to make with family this year. You look back to past Christmases and you think about Christmases in the past spent with family. That's so much of what Christmas is about. 
Well, as we think about the Jewish people, Father Abraham had a lot to do with the family of Israel. And so that's why we get this song, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham, I am one of them and so are you, so let's just praise the Lord. Why does the church sing that though? If it's about Israel, if, if Abraham is the father of Israel, why are we singing that today in the church? Why do we get to be a part of that family? Why do we get to be a part of the family of God? Because that is what Israel is. That is what Israel was, is God's people, God's family with Abraham as the figurehead, the father of his people. So why do you and I today get to be a part of that family? Why do we get to sing that song? Well, that song has lyrics that come not just from the Old Testament, from the New Testament as well. Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9 says this, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons and daughters of Abraham. Those who are of faith who are the sons and daughters of Abraham. In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, by the way, if you're not a Jew in the room, that's what you are. I'm a Gentile, you're a Gentile, we're all Gentiles. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. See, y'all, in Jesus' identity that we're going to look at this morning as the son of Abraham, we find a great hope that we too will be made part of the family of God. Just think about Christmas and family let those thoughts, let those, those times, those memories drive you to the, the greater family, the eternal family, the family of God that God has provided for us. And it's Jesus' identity as the, the son of Abraham that gives you and I access to that. Not through blood, not through descent, but through faith. First, though, if we're going to appreciate our identity as part of God's family, we have to appreciate our identity when we were not part of God's family. With that in mind, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to start here before we get into Galatians. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul's opening up in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 with the, the bad news of who we were before Christ. And in verse 3, we read this. He says that we uh, were those who, among whom, the, the, the children of wrath, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That means before being brought into the family of God, we're part of a different family. And nobody is naturally born into the family of God. We're born into the, this family where we are all children of wrath. In fact, that's what he says in verse 3. We all once lived in this family. But not only that, jump down to verses 11 and 12. Verse 11, he says, Therefore, remember at one time you Gentiles, remember that's us, in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by the Jews, those that are called the circumcision. In other words, the Jews were saying, you're outside, you're not a part of us. Remember, verse 12, and here it is, remember that at one time you were separated from Christ. Okay? alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, the commonwealth of Israel being citizenship. You had no part in the people of God. You were on the outside as Gentiles. He goes on, he says, you were strangers to the covenants of promise. You, beyond that, had no hope in the world and you were without God. This is who we are prior to coming to Christ. This is how we're born. We're born alienated. We're born on the outside. We're born not a part of the family, but we're born without family. We're born isolated. We're born the children of wrath, not the children of God. And it's that reality that we have to understand before we're going to really come to appreciate why it matters that Jesus in this manger is the son of Abraham. Why does it matter? Because we were on the outside wanting to be on the inside, and there's no way for us to get in the inside without Jesus. We'll get there. But first... I think we have to, to put ourselves back in the shoes of what it felt like to be not part of the nation of Israel. Because you and I today, we're part of the church. You're sitting in this room. You, you're, you're here at the church. If, if you're a Christian, you would say, yeah, I'm part of the church. And in a sense, we kind of think of ourselves like we're the seniors and everybody else in the world are the, the underclassmen. Like we belong. We've got the security. Like we've got it right. We're here. And don't get me wrong. We do. The gospel is right. The word of God is right. Being a part of the church is the place to be. And everyone should want to be a part of the church. We pray for that. But y'all, that's not how it's always been. There was a time when we were, all of us in this room, outside of God's family. There was a time when we weren't part of the church. And back in first century Israel, for you and I in this room, unless you were a native Jew, you were outside completely. 
In fact, if, if you wanted to go to the temple, you could get to the court of the Gentiles, but that's it. You couldn't get inside. We were on the outside wanting to be on the inside, but the problem was until Christ came as the son of Abraham, that was really all about were you natively a descendant of Israel? Did you belong? The reality is none of us did. But that exclusion had more to do with just our, our physical exclusion. It was a spiritual exclusion as well. We were on the outside looking in. We were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of the promise. We had no hope in God. But then it, it lands on that idea of we were, in verse 3 of Ephesians 2, children of wrath. We were on the outside when it comes to our spiritual standing with God as well, not just our biological, not just our national identity. It's an uncomfortable idea, but it's one we have to come to terms with. If you're a believer here this morning, you already have come to terms with this. You've come to terms with this idea that you are or were at one time alienated from God, not part of his family, and that you needed to be made part of his family. And as we think about that this Christmas season, you say, well, why do I want to think about that at Christmas time? Because when we look at this baby in the manger, the son of Abraham, it should remind us of why he had to come in the first place. Why did Jesus need to come? And this morning, what I want us to think about is he had to come because we were on the outside of God's family with no way to get on the inside without this baby. Our first point this morning is this. Feel the weight of being outside of God's family. Feel the weight of being outside of God's family. I don't know if you've ever been excluded from something, left out, not picked. My, my guess is most of you in the room have felt that way. I know I have. Or even just a stranger in a, a place that it just feels off. I, I felt that this past week. I got to go back to California for uh, our, our board meetings, for our church plant. And while I was back there, I, I, I mean, I was there for six years. And, and I was on staff at this church for six years. And I went into this building where I worked in, a newer building, but worked there for two years in this building. I had an office in that building. And I knew everybody in the building and everything else. And I was back and I was walking in. And, and there were familiar faces. And it was fun to, to catch up with some people and to see everybody. But there was a very real sense that I was was on the outside. Everything felt familiar, and yet at the same time, I, I, I saw all of this activity going on around me that I wasn't a part of anymore. And when I was there and a pastor at that church, I, I was a part of all of that. I knew what was going on, at least, in the different ministries happening there. But I, I sat in our, our, our main area, because that was the other thing, too. I didn't have an office anymore. There was no place for me there. And so everything that once was so familiar, all of a sudden, I, I just felt out of place. I felt on the outside looking in, and it just was... There was a measure of feeling a, a level of discomfort with that. Well, multiply that to a, an infinite level when it comes to how we should feel when we think about not being part of the family of God. Maybe some of you in this room were adopted and you can remember the time when you wanted a family. Or maybe you have adopted and you sense this in a, a way that, that others can't even appreciate. Wanting to be part of a family. That's the, that's the thing prior to Christ we're orphans and children of wrath. Prior to coming to Christ, we have no familial identity. We have no claim on God. And that's a weight that we should feel. And, and here's the thing. You might think, well, is it really that bad to be outside of God's family? Yeah, and listen why. Here's some descriptions of those that are outside of God's family. Revelation 21.8, how about this crowd? The cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and the liars. You say, well, Am I really one of those? Yeah, without Christ, you are. Is that it? No, no. It, it, he goes, goes on. Revelation 21, 27. Here's others that are going to be outside, eternally speaking. Those that are unclean. Anyone who does what is detestable or false, they're going to be on the, the outside. Again, is, is that the crowd that we want to be a part of? One more. Revelation 22, verse 15. He says, outside are the dogs. You might be a dog person. Dogs were not well thought of during this time. Think of the coyotes, the rabid animals, the mangy animals. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. This is not the crowd that I hope any of us in this room want to be a part of. And yet, prior to coming to Christ, this is who we were. Maybe not in the fullest degree. But all of us had this measure of sin within our hearts. This is what put us outside of the family of God. 
And so throughout the scriptures, God calls us to remember these things. You say, why? Why would God want me to remember this? Because when we remember it, it causes, this, causes us to appreciate what we have in this baby in the manger, Jesus, the son of Abraham, to a much, much, much greater degree. God did this with Israel. He told them in the book of Deuteronomy, he said, you know what? It's, it's not because uh, you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you because you were the fewest of all peoples. In other words, God's telling Israel, remember who you were before I called you to myself. He's saying it's not that you were anything immensely special or great or grand or verse eight, he goes on, but it's because why? Why did God choose you? Because he loves you. And because he's keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers, that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you, remember where you were in the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God calls his people Israel to remember where they were and who they were in order to much more greatly appreciate who he is and what he's done for them. That's what we're calling us to do with this first point this morning. Remember who you were prior to Christ. And maybe you don't want to go into too much detail with that. I, go, I understand that. I, I can appreciate that. But at least remember that you were outside of the family, wanting to be inside of the family, and yet unable. And yet unable. When you didn't belong. So allow the warmth of your family gathering this Christmas to prompt you to remember God's mercy on you in that regard. Because as we're about to see, he took you from being outside of the family and brought you into the family. The question is how? The question is how, and that's where we turn to the book of Galatians. So grab your Bibles and flip over to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, but as you're getting there, I just want to point out a couple of other verses because this is what's changed. Verse 13, back in Ephesians chapter 2, says, But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near. Okay, just a change has taken place. We were outside, now Paul's saying we've been brought inside. We've been reconciled is the word. You've been brought near to God. You were far off, now you're near. What changed? Well, in Romans 8, Paul in Romans 8 says, you've now received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. What father in Romans 8? Who are we talking about there? Talking about, it's okay. This is a Sunday school answer. You will not get this wrong, I promise you. Rhymes with odd, starts with a G. God, there we go, right? That we are adopted. We can cry out, Abba, Father. The Father being God. God, right? Okay, Look in, are you in Galatians 3? Look at verse 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of, stop, look up. What would you expect, Paul, to write there? Those of faith who are the sons of what? God. You would expect Paul to write God there. But what does it say? Abraham. Well, how did Abraham get in there? Is this a typo? Is this like Galatians? I don't think so. In fact, I don't just not think so. No, it's not a typo. He put Abraham in there on purpose. Why? Why is Abraham there? That's what we want to answer. Sons of Abraham. Sons and daughters of Abraham. Why sons of Abraham? Well, this has to do with the broader context of Galatians. In the book of Galatians, Paul's writing to a church that was under attack from a false teaching. And this false teaching was telling those in the church, if you really want to be accepted by God, you have to do in all this big list. You have to be obedient to the law. You have to submit to the requirements of the law. In fact, you have to be circumcised. You have to do this. You have to do that. You have to become Jewish to be accepted by God. So Paul's writing to this church saying, wait a second. In fact, if you look just up the page from verse 7 there, verses 2 and 3 in Galatians, he says this. He says, let me ask you this. Did you receive the spirit? By the way, that spirit of adoption that he wrote about in Romans 8. Did you receive that spirit by works of the law? Or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? In other words, are, are you trying to make yourself fully acceptable to God through your obedience? It all began with faith and the gift of the Spirit. Why are you trying to make yourself more acceptable? God's already made you acceptable, is his argument here. Let me connect this now to Abraham, because you may be still going, okay, but what about Abraham? All right, back in... in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham, it said, God brings him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to them, said to him, so shall your offspring be, your offspring, your descendants, your sons and daughters of Abraham. Okay, so shall your offspring be. Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had father Abraham. 
for the longest time, that had everything to do with physical descent. Were you part of the nation? Were you nationally a descendant of Abraham? That made you part of God's family. Were you part of the people of Israel? Now, were there Jewish proselytes, those that would come in from Gentile nations? Yeah, but they were brought in and they were made to go through all of the Jewish practices. They were functionally brought in and brought into the Jewish practices of adherence to the law and circumcision and baptism as a proselyte and all of these things that they would do for the Jewish person, this this Gentile person brought into the the Jewish community, and then they would now be interacting with God based on on those, those operations, those things. But the paradigm was beginning to shift here. Because for so long, it would have been all about your national identity. Now Paul's saying in Galatians 3, 7, what did he say? Those who are of what? Faith who are sons and daughters of Abraham. Do you see the, sh- the shift in, in the paradigm there? This is pretty seismic. And it, 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 we don't realize it because we're Gentiles sitting here in the church and it's always been salvation by faith. But, but this was a massive shift in understanding. Abraham, the figurehead of the people of God. Now all of a sudden we can be one of Abraham's sons. I am one of them and so are you. This is why we sing it as the church. And it didn't have to do with our works. It doesn't have to do with whether or not we're physically descended from Abraham. Now it has everything to do with this new paradigm, which is faith. The paradigm changed. It's no longer blood that defines us as in or outside of the family of God. Remember point number one? All of us at one point in time were outside of the family of God, wanting to be inside, but we couldn't get inside. And I said, God changed that. God made a way. Ephesians 2.13, he's brought us near. How? Through this descendant, the son of Abraham. It's no longer about blood, but of faith. Because of this son of Abraham, who made it possible for all of us to become sons and daughters of Abraham. Everything has changed for those who can become part of God's family and how it happens. And the way, that the, the key change, the thing that I want you to understand more than anything else right now, is that it's shifted from works and trusting in national identity to faith. Point number two this morning is this. Celebrate our inclusion by faith. Celebrate our inclusion by faith. This is good news for us that we don't have to adhere to or be baptized into or go through any of the, the, the rigmarole of the Jewish law in order to be brought into the family of God. That's not what makes you in or out of the family of God anymore. The, the whole equation has shifted and now it's about faith. Paul drives this home in further detail in Romans chapter 4. In Romans 4, verse 11, speaking of Abraham, he says, He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. You might be thinking, what in the world? Well, he goes on. He says this, And to make him, Abraham, the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Let me unravel that for us, unpack that, untangle that. What Paul is basically saying there is this sign of circumcision, which in the Jewish community is massively significant and important, is the sign of the covenant. Paul's reminding his readers that that was given to Abraham after his faith was counted to him as righteousness, not before. Why does that matter? So that it couldn't be an act of obedience that produced the righteousness. That Abraham's righteous standing before God was not because he did something, but because he trusted in something. And Paul says that was in order that now you and I can sit here today and the paradigm can be shifted so that we can be sons and daughters of Abraham by faith and not by works. Because of this, because of what's happened here. Faith. But we have to be careful about what our faith is in. It has to be in the right thing, and we're going to develop that in just a moment. But there's things that we put our faith in that aren't the right thing. And I want to talk about a few of those this morning because I think some in the room may be in this camp. Sometimes we put our our faith in a prayer or a conversion event. In other words, maybe you went to a rally at some point. You went to a, a massive one of those stadium rallies, and you heard a preacher preach, and you said, yeah, that's me. I feel the conviction of the Spirit. Everybody else is getting up. They're playing come as you are. I'm going to come as I am. And you came down front, and they said every eye closed, every head bowed, and they prayed a prayer, and you prayed with them, and then you went on your life, and you thought, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. And now listen, do people get saved that way? Yes, 100% absolutely people get saved that way but you can't trust in that event for your salvation. 
that event did not save you. That coming down front didn't take you from outside of the family of God and put you in the family of God. And so if you've gone on from that moment and you really haven't thought about much about God or you haven't really darkened the doors of the church since then, you haven't really picked up your, your Bible since then, you haven't really pursued a relationship with God since then, then I might say that you're trusting in that event more than you're trusting in a relationship with God for your salvation. That's not a faith that brings you outside of the family of God and inside of the family of God. That's why Jesus says there's going to be many who say to me on the last day, Lord, Lord, weren't we inside the family? And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. So we can't trust in that. What else do we need to be on guard against? Well, I, I mentioned we're having baptism coming up. We cannot trust in baptism for our salvation. You know what? That's one of the reasons why we do not baptize infants. Because I, I, I don't want anyone ever at any point to look back at an act of baptism from us, from me or from Pastor Rod, and, and say, well, I'm good with God because Pastor PJ baptized me. I can't make you good with God. You being baptized doesn't make you saved. And so trusting in that is not going to bring you from outside of the family of God and put you inside the family of God. Is baptism good? Yes. Just like can some of those rallies be good where people can genuinely be saved? Yes. But those are not the object of our faith. What else do we put our trust in that we need to be careful about? Proximity. This is the I've always gone to church argument. Always going to church never saves anybody. If your trust is in the fact that you hung out with Christians, that's not how it works. That's not going to get you from outside the family to inside the family. Let's keep going. Good works. Being a good person does not bring you from outside the family to inside the family. We talked about that in greater detail last week. We'd encourage you to go back and listen to that sermon if you weren't here. But we can't do enough good works to overcome our sin. Good works are a lousy source of our faith or object of our faith. How about knowledge? This is the pharisaical position. This is the position that says, well, I know a whole lot about the Bible, and I know a whole lot about Jesus, and I know a whole lot about Scripture, and I know a whole lot. Listen, there are plenty of seminary students in hell currently because they didn't have a genuine relationship with faith, with God. Their faith was in their intellect. We can't put our faith in what we know. That's why Paul said when he was making his defense, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. He doesn't say, for I know what I have believed. He said, for I know whom I have believed. So we can't put our faith in what we know. Finally, we can't put our faith in earthly blessings. Well, I'm looking around. My life is going pretty well, so God must be happy with me. No, that's, that's not where our trust is to be anchored either. These are all things that we're tempted to, to trust in. To tempted to say, well, I'm good with God. I'm inside because of these things. But none of these things, y'all, make you a part of God's family any more than pitching your tent on the lawn of Buckingham Palace makes you part of the royal family. If you could get past the funny-looking guards that don't do anything and, and set up a tent on, on the lawn and say, well, look at me. I'm an heir to the throne now because I've got a tent on the lawn of Buckingham Palace. Y'all, that's like trusting proximity to the church to save you. That's like trusting that hanging out with Christians is somehow going to get you into the family of God. Our faith has to be in something else. Yes, it's shifted. Yes, we are included by faith. And that is something to be celebrated. But we have to know what it is that we have to have faith in. That's one of the reasons why we're studying John. And we're going to jump back into John in the new year. Because John said, I've written these things. John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31. He said, I've written these things to you so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing in him, faith in him, might produce in you eternal life. And so it's about what we have faith in, or who, rather, we have faith in. See, here's the thing. Everybody has faith. Everybody has faith. It's not that you have faith as a Christian, but your atheist relative doesn't have faith in anything. Everyone has faith in something. The question is, does what we have faith in or who we have faith in have the ability to get us from outside the family of God to inside the family of God? There is a faith that does that, and that's what Galatians 3, 7 is telling us. It is those who are faith who are now the sons and daughters of Abraham. Who is that that we're supposed to have faith in? That's why we're talking about Jesus, the son of Abraham, this morning. Our access to God's family comes through faith in God's promises. But what does all of this have to do with Jesus and Abraham? If you're in Galatians still, look at verse 8. Galatians 3, verse 8. 
It says this, in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Remember, that's you and me, Gentiles. Gentiles by faith. That's what we're just talking about, okay? Preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. E-breaks need to be going off in your, in your mind right now. God preached the gospel to Abraham? I thought the gospel was a New Testament thing. How can the gospel be preached to Abraham? I, Abraham's an Old Testament. What? And how is this the gospel? Saying, in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Okay, this is one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible, Galatians 3, 8 is. It's dripping with gospelly goodness. It's so good. And here's a couple of reasons why I love it. Number one, it reminds us, church, that our salvation was not plan B. That, that it was not as though God was like, well, this whole law thing's not working out too well, so let's try to figure out something else. Hey, Jesus, what are you doing? Uh, you got time to go down there and, and live a perfect life and die on the cross for us? Can you do that? It's not as though God woke up some, at some point and looked down at Adam and even be like, what did you do? And get the, the, the Trinity together in a holy huddle to figure out the God. It was always his plan. And so from the very beginning and the very outset, he's got the gospel that is just this louder and louder drumbeat coursing through the pages of scripture until it culminates at the cross. And this is one of the cadences that we find in the Old Testament when he's promising Abraham, and you will all the families of the earth be blessed. The gospel of goodness is there. But the second thing is, is that Paul's saying that all of this talk about faith and Abraham, all of this stuff that we've been talking about so far this morning, really underlying all of that is the gospel, the gospel that you and I know and understand, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and that he rose from the dead so that we can live with him forever and that if we will repent from our sins and trust in that, we will be forgiven and saved. That all of that is bound up in Abraham. How? Glad you asked. Genesis 15, 6, Okay. Here's the verse, here's the phrase, he believed the Lord, Abraham did, and it was counted to him as what? Righteousness, okay? He believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. All right, that's the fundamental equation of the gospel, isn't it? Faith yields righteousness. If we're just to boil the gospel down to its kernel, down to the, to, to the underlying core reality of the gospel, it's this, faith produces righteousness. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Okay? That in mind, Genesis 12, verse 3. Speaking to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. This phrase here, and in you, Abraham, in you, Abraham, will all the families of the earth be blessed. In you will all the families of the earth be blessed. Uh, Genesis 18, 18 says that all the nations will be blessed, okay? Follow me for a second. You ready? Because I'm hoping to connect the dots. Because you may be out there going, okay, I'm, I'm, I think I'm tracking, but I'm not quite there. Follow me for a second. In Abraham, God provided the gospel paradigm. Faith produces righteousness, right? Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That, as I said, is the foundation of the gospel, that's the paradigm, that if we want to be righteous, it's anchored to faith. That was a promise given to Abraham, okay? That's the paradigm given there. In the same context, when God tells Abraham, your faith is producing righteousness, your faith, I'm going to credit righteousness to your account because of your faith. In that same context, with that same individual, Abraham, God promises him that through him, that blessing of faith producing righteousness will be now made available to all the families and nations of the earth. Okay? So you've got the, the gospel paradigm, and then you've got the promise to Abraham where God says, through you, that promise is going to be made available to all the families and nations of the earth. Now we come to the final pivot point here to ask, how was that made available to all the fam families of the earth? Was it through Abraham himself? No. No. How do I know that? Because Abraham died before that blessing came to all the families of the earth. So in what sense would it be through Abraham? Well, it would be in the sense that through one of Abraham's descendants. In other words, a distant son of Abraham would bring to fruition the promise made to Abraham that through him all the families of the earth would be blessed with the reality that faith will produce righteousness. And that's why Jesus is the son of Adam, or son of Abraham, excuse me, matters to us. 
this descendant, this distant son of Abraham, Jesus, would make a way for all peoples everywhere to now all of a sudden be able to enter into God's family, to go from the outside to the inside. And how would he do that? He would do that through providing the means through faith that we could have righteousness the same way that Abraham had faith that produced righteousness. And so it was through Jesus, the son of Abraham, this baby in the manger that we celebrate this Christmas, the one that Matthew announced at the beginning of his gospel, Jesus, the son of Abraham, it's through this one that God has made a way and fulfilled the promise that now you and I can have access to the same position that Abraham had. We can believe God and he will credit it to us as righteousness. Jesus, the son of Abraham. When we trust in God, it's credited to us as righteousness just as it was to Abraham. And so that's why we celebrate our inclusion by faith. But our, second and, or our third and final point this morning is this. We celebrate our inclusion. We celebrate, rather, Jesus as the fulfillment of God's promises. We celebrate Jesus as the fulfillment of God's promises. The Bible really is y'all telling one story from beginning to the end. And that's, that's what I was referencing there with, with the idea that, that this promise is given to Abraham. That's why it is the gospel. It's the gospel in Genesis 12, 3. It's the gospel in Genesis 3, 15, even before that. When God tells the, the woman, when God tells Eve, hey, you know what? Your offspring, the serpent is going to strike his heel, but he's going to crush his head. Do you guys know that the, the gospel is on the scene nine verses after the fall of man? God's already saying, I'm going to remedy this. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to make a way for you, for you to be brought from the outside to the inside. Same thing in Genesis 12, 3. That's God saying, I'm going to make a way not just for you, Abraham, or for the people of Israel, Abraham, but for all the nations and families of the earth. That's, that's us, y'all, in this room, to be brought from the outside to the inside. And it would come through the descendant, Jesus, the son of Abraham. The promises of God fulfilled in this one person, Jesus. The one born in Bethlehem in Micah 5, 2. The one who would be born of the virgin in Isaiah 7, 14. The one who is the son of Abraham, fulfilling the promise of, of Genesis 12, 3. Y'all, that is such good news. It's good news that our standing with God is not based on our works. It's good news even that our standing with God is not based on what foreign or national or international identity, identity that we descend from. This is why when we get into the book of Revelation as we're reading in our daily Bible reading together, when John sees people in heaven, you know how he describes it? There's people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Why? Because of Genesis 12, 3. Because through the son of Abraham, all the families, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That is such good news. The main one of these promises, though, that we're talking about this morning and that I want to press into this morning is the promise of faith producing righteousness. It's a promise that we find echoed in the New Testament. In Romans 10, 9, Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and what? Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Believing produces saving righteousness. He goes on in verse 10 and he says, for with the heart one believes and is justified. That word justified means to be declared righteous. That's what we're talking about. Righteous, right with God, right? It's not just a not guilty, it's an innocent. When the gavel falls and it's belief, it's faith that produces justification. It's not works, it's not genealogy, it's belief. How about Acts? Acts chapter 16, 31. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. In other words, what, what must be, we do to be saved? Here's the answer. Believe. Faith produces righteousness. Why? Because of the paradigm that goes all the way back to, to Genesis with Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And because through Abraham would all the families of the earth be blessed and Jesus is the fulfillment of that, that paradigm still holds true for you and me this morning. We believe God and it's credited to us as righteousness. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever, what, believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. One more, John 1, 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. These are the promises 
that if you believe, you will be saved. And again, believe what? It's the belief that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. As the payment for your sins in your place on the cross. That God's wrath was poured out on him. And that God raised him from the dead three days later. That's the, the, the two key cogs of the gospel. We're believing that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and that he rose from the dead three days later. If you believe that he died on the cross for your sins, your sins will be forgiven. And as we trust that he rose from the dead three days later, we trust that we too will one day raise to, to live with him for all of eternity. That's the message that brings you from outside the family to inside the family. So let me ask you this morning, if you have not yet believed, honestly, what's holding you back? You've heard me ask this question before, but I want to ask it again. Why not today? What is it, what's the, the, the kernel, what's the, the core objection that you have that's keeping you from putting your trust in Jesus and receiving the righteousness of God because of the son of Abraham? What is holding you back today? Remember that 10 to the 17th number? Well, as I mentioned, it's believed by scholars that Jesus fulfilled well over 400 messianic promises. But let's just use the number 48. If Jesus fulfilled 48 prophecies, which scripture and history has affirmed, the chances of that happening is 10 to the 157th power. I don't know how deep the silver dollars go at that point. Here's my ask of you this morning, if you're not there yet, if you haven't yet trusted in Jesus. I've got a twofold question slash challenge. Number one, I've already asked it, but what's holding you back? Why not today? And if it's today and you want to make that decision, I, I know of a number of people in this room that would be glad to talk with you about that, myself included. Come find me afterwards. We can go. We can sit down together somewhere, and we can talk through what it means to put your trust in Jesus. I would love to do that. I know Pastor Rod would love to do that. It's the most important decision that you can make, and I'm going to urge you and implore you, as Paul said, to do that. Make that decision today. If you, if you examine your heart, and at the, in your heart, at the end of the day, you go, man, there's nothing holding me back from trusting in Jesus. There's nothing holding me back except that, man, I just, I, I'm worried that I might have egg in my face because I've resisted for so long. Man, let's build a bridge and get over ourselves on that one, and let's come to faith in Jesus today, okay? It's time. Meet with somebody. Talk with somebody. That's number one. Number two is this. If, if that's if you're not willing to do that, I, I want to encourage you this Christmas season, as you consider this baby in the manger, the son of Abraham, I want to ask you, look into the evidence. Look into the evidence. Two resources I'm going to suggest for you. There's many more, but two I'm going to suggest for you. If you want to go deep, here's one. Evidence that demands a verdict by Josh McDowell. Evidence that demands a verdict by Josh McDowell. Pick up that book and Sean McDowell, his dad. Pick up that book and that, if you want to get into the weeds... And see the reliability of scripture and these prophecies and the testimonies. That's a great book for you. If you're looking for something a little bit lighter, but that's still going to bring you face to face with a lot of these confirmed realities, I would suggest this one to you, The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Pick up one of those two books during this Christmas season and give your attention to this. Listen, we're, we're dealing with eternal life here. There is no more important decision for you to make than what you will do about Jesus. Because we're talking about eternity. And our eternity changed. We went from the outside to the inside. Why? Because Jesus came as the son of Abraham. Because he fulfilled that promise. And now you and I, when we put our trust in Jesus, we are credited ourselves with righteousness. So yeah, Christmas and family. As you think about Christmas this year, as you think about, as you spend time with your family this year, think about what that baby, that son of Abraham has done for us. There was a time when all of us were outside of the family of God. And that changed because of Jesus, the son of Abraham. Paul's able to write, by faith, we are sons and daughters of Abraham because of Jesus. Because he came, because he lived that perfect life, because he died on the cross for our sins. And if we will trust him for that, he will give us his righteousness as he takes from us our sin. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for that great reality of who Christ is and what he's done for us, the forgiveness that we have in him, the glorious reality of all of those things, God, is, is something that 
We don't want to become tone deaf to this season. We don't want to become so familiar with the trappings of Christmas that we lose the wonder that you would take us from outside and bring us inside. And that to do that, you wouldn't require that we jump through all kinds of different hoops or that we go through ceremony and tradition, but simply that we would repent from our sins and trust Jesus, our Savior. So, Lord, I I pray for anyone in this room that hasn't done that. I pray that they would be truly pondering that question, why not? And God, I ask that they would be honest with themselves with that question this morning as they come to terms with the answer. And Lord, I pray that they would even be willing to to ask a follow-up question to say, is there something that I've chosen not to pursue that might provide the answer to the questions that I still have? Lord, for any in the room and the rest in the room that have, have trusted in Christ as their Savior, what a glorious reality that is. I pray that this would be a season of great celebration of our inclusion, celebration of the promises fulfilled by Jesus, celebration of this great reality that because of Jesus, the son of Abraham, the promise made to Abraham that his faith would result in righteousness is now ours to participate in as well. Lord, that is a joyful thing indeed. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.